we monitor the chat. So if you have questions, please put those in the chat. And thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, if you don't know, I'm Daniel Jordan. I'm one of the faculty developers at the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence. And with me presenting today will be Samantha Parisi and Emily Kachansky. And they're our simulation specialists. And we're going to hopefully solve some questions you might have about teaching from behind a mask and how to overcome that barrier. So I'm going to share my screen. As soon as this decides to cooperate. All right, everybody see teaching from behind a mask? Fantastic. All right, so one of the questions that always comes up or that you should always ask in your classroom when you're teaching while mask is, can you hear me in the back? That's kind of the folks we're worried about. Generally speaking, the folks in the front of the room don't have near as uh, difficult time as the folks in the back of the classroom have hearing you. And more importantly, everyone might be able to hear you, but can they understand what you're saying? So those are two, uh, two items we need to check off and, and have those issues solved before teaching or learning can actually happen. The obvious answer to those questions or the obvious solution to that problem, I mean, would be to speak louder and to speak slower than usual when you're teaching from behind a mask. Emily and Sam have some great tips and tricks uh, as trained vocalists to help you uh, get your loud voice on. And uh, they're going to share those in just a little bit. But what I want to spend my time focused on is some of the strategies and pedagogy behind teaching with a mask on. So, of course, uh, one thing you can do is to frequently ask your students for feedback. Uh, you want to design a way for your students to let you know if they're having trouble hearing or understanding you. So this can be simply, you know, raise your hand if you can hear me. So you get that instant feedback. And obviously, if they don't hear you, you won't see hands in the air. Uh, you could even come up with a token. You could pass out index cards, colored something, and if they have a problem hearing you, they could just put that on the desk as a visual cue to you that lets them know without interrupting you that something is uh, amiss with the communication. And then you're not necessarily interrupted, but you know you might need to repeat some things and ask for some clarification. You want to use your body language and nonverbal cues. Uh, you might have noticed the music at the beginning of our session today. The title of the song was T uh, Eyes Without a Face. So, I mean, that's really what you are when you're masked, your eyes without a face. Uh, it's important to avoid standing in one place when you're lecturing. That's good practice anytime, but it's especially important when you're wearing a mask because you want to give everyone a chance to be in the front row, even though they might miss, might not necessarily want to be in the front row, they need to be in close proximity to you at some point during the class, especially if you're lecturing. So moving around the room is important. And secondly, it's okay to be animated. Most of us are like me, I talk with my hands a lot. If you tied my hands behind my back, I might have a hard time getting the word out. So um, it's okay to be that way. And it might be beneficial to be intentional with uh, your animations. So something to think about, uh, it's not fit for every person or for every lesson, but there are times where animation is necessary to give those nonverbal cues. A huge help will be utilizing your online course shell inside the classroom. This is of course a place where you should be posting announcements, you share important information and resources with your students. You can collect and grade assignments there. Uh, Karen has developed a really great uh, course for teaching and learning that's actually open right now. It's uh, CTL 220. It's using D2L to support on ground and blended instruction. It's chock full of ideas for using that online course shell in the physical space. So if you have questions about that or you're interested in signing up for that course, please let us know. We'll get you in there and uh, it'll, it'll, it's one hour self paced get you in and out, but it gives you a lot of uh, tips and strategies and tools to use for that online course shelf in the physical space. You wanna make sure you're providing additional resources for your students who might need them. So over the course of the semester, students might discover that they require accessibility services. It would be beneficial for your students if a link to our accessibility services, our Office of Accessibility Services was provided in your syllabus or in your course shell, just in case they might need it. And you could let them know where they can find that information. But uh, just knowing that those things are available 
might ease some some tensions for your students who might be having a hard time and may need more than just what you can do as the instructor with voice training or these extra tips and tricks to reach them. So please provide that information. Another great idea uh, is to lean heavily on your formative assessment strategies, using things like polls and surveys and quizzes. Even small group discussions uh, can be helpful because you can, again, rotate around the classroom and gain a little physical proximity where you can hear the students, the students can hear you. But uh, any way you can gather feedback, you definitely want to use that. So uh, utilize polling, uh, you poll everywhere. There's the Kahoot polls. You could even set up a Zoom meeting just for the polling piece. Uh, using things like exit tickets or one minute papers. All these strategies are listed on our formative and summative assessment website. There's a link here and I'll be happy to post the link in the chat here in just a second to that page. But uh, if you have ideas or you need help, uh, the folks in CTLE are more than just ed tech support. We actually have quite a bit of classroom experience and we're happy to lend our expertise and come up with things that might work for you in your class. Daniel, there's yeah. a question um, that uh, someone would like you to elaborate on exit tickets. So an exit ticket. An exit ticket is just a slip of paper or a place that in the discussion board that your students post answers to a question that helps you determine whether they understood what you needed them to understand for that class. So it could be an open-ended question. Uh, it could be, give me, you know, three things you learned, two questions you have, and your one big takeaway from the day, a three, two, one kind of deal. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to use an exit ticket, but it's just something that they hand you out the door or submit on their way out the door that you can go back later and use again as formative assessment to let you know, was my teaching effective? Did they hear me? Um, did they understand me? And did they leave with what I wanted them to leave with? So uh, when you're doing any of these things, whether it's a poll or a quiz or a minute paper exit ticket, it's really important to include some element of were you able to hear and understand the instruction today? That's, again, an opportunity for them to give you feedback on not just the content, but their access to the content if it was verbal. That help? So another thing you might want to consider, and I know this is not everybody's favorite thing to do or something that everyone is uh, extremely comfortable with. Hopefully over the last year, we've gained some comfort from being behind a camera. But you might want to consider recording lecture material. And here's why. Uh, flipped lessons are great. It's a great way for students to consume content outside of the classroom. And then they show up with a little bit of knowledge and they can you know, conduct activities or engage in activities that allow them to demonstrate their level of knowledge or skill in whatever area they're working with, with you there to facilitate as the instructor. So instead of, excuse me, instead of being the stage on the stage, delivering the content, students arrive with content and questions about the content already in hand. And then you can get messy working with it inside the classroom. You might even wanna consider playing a recording of your lecture in class, just so your students don't have to try to figure out what you're saying from behind a mask. So again, it's uncomfortable to watch yourself and hear yourself for most of us, but providing that resource for your students uh, allows them to view the lecture and have you there in real time to answer their questions. You can always pause the recording and answer questions. You can also post that recording for students to access later in D2L. So there are a lot of positives if you can overcome the, the anxiety and the negative thoughts about seeing and hearing yourself on video, especially for lecture material that's important for students to be able to hear and understand. And again, it provides a space for students to ask questions without, uh, without all of the information being delivered from behind the mask. Another strategy to use would be providing opportunities for students to collaborate virtually. So use your D2L discussion boards, create a space where they can ask the instructor, they drop questions for you to answer uh, offline. And those are viewable for everyone. So if their peers have a, same, a similar question, they go to that discussion board and see what your answer is. You avoid having to repeat yourself. Uh, create a virtual parking lot where students can post and ask questions. It can be a discussion board, it could be a Padlet, it could be Flipgrid so they can have video interactions, but just some kind of virtual space outside of the traditional classroom where students can interact, ask questions, 
and those can be addressed again without masking being necessary. Uh, create collaborative virtual assignments to use in the classroom. Again, if you're going to do a flipped lesson where they view a video or you know some consume some content outside of the classroom, and they come in. It's, they don't have to necessarily be hands on with some materials unless it's appropriate for the lesson. If it's not, maybe it's appropriate to create something virtual where students can still be in groups. They do small group work, but all that happens online. It's easier for you to uh, do some progress monitoring without having to be in the same physical space. So there are a lot of pluses to that. Uh, you might consider using something like Mozilla Hubs, uh, Frame VR, Kumo Spaces, or another virtual tool to create a virtual gallery wall. So rather than doing in-class presentations, students post their information to one of these spaces and they can be viewed virtually. You could do that in class, you could do that outside of class, but it gives you some more options. Lastly, for, for my part here, before I hand it off to Sam and Emily, uh, three important things to remember. One, be flexible. This is not gonna go perfectly every time. Uh, teaching from behind a mask is difficult. There's a reason we didn't do this originally, right? So uh, just be aware and give yourself some grace, give your students some grace, but most importantly is building those relationships with your students so that you can work together to find ways to deliver content and for them to consume content and for you all to work in the classroom environment while everyone's masked in a way that works for you and works for them. Uh, and one way you can do that is by establishing norms. If your students know what's expected of them and how to get help when they have trouble, uh, things go a lot better than they do when things are kind of just haphazard, raise a hand, we're trying to interrupt and do things. If students know there's a procedure for doing things and they can follow that, it makes your life easier and makes their experience a lot better. So with all that said, I'm gonna stop my screen and Emily and Sam have some excellent content to wrap us up. Okay, thank you. So generally people find that, um, that they, will understand and be very forgiving of technical issues um, with video, but if they cannot hear, they will just tune you out. So how, what can you do when you, hold on a second, uh, speaking of technical issues, what can you do uh, to get, regain your students' attention? Well, first and foremost, it's very important that your eyes um, express what you want them to express. And so we have a short video to explain that point. Yeah. I snapped this photo of him last time he dropped off Zoe. Observe, the bottom half of his face is smiling. Look, he seems happy, seems like a nice guy. But the top half of his face ah! wants to murder you. Cheerful. Ah! Wants to murder you, no cheerful. <laughs> to murder you now hold on let me ask him a question captain what do you think of ice cream oh he loves it oh. captain what do you think of rainy days mm. oh, oh he hates him so obviously even though your your face is covered and you feel like you shouldn't have to do anything it does make a difference if you're smiling your eyes will show it and um if you're scowling your eyes will show it and if you're one of those people that can um, differentiate between the two and be smiling like the captain and still not show it in your eyes. You have to use your uh, Tyra Banks uh, uh, trick of smizing, which is smiling with your eyes. The other major things that we want to remind you is to slow down, pause, take your time. Um, it feels very stilted at first, but it helps with your student's comprehension and it helps get your point across. You want to project, not shout, and Emily will be discussing that in a little bit. And most importantly, another short video. You face the tick. Speak up. I can't understand a word you're saying through those stupid masks. Enunciate. Thank you, tick. Yes, enunciate. <laughs> It is very important, especially if you're uh, usually uh, speaking very fast or you have um, an accent that maybe your students don't understand. You want to take your time, slow down and enunciate. As we said, people will understand all kinds of video and technical issues, but if they cannot hear you, they will tune you out. Um, don't stand in one place for too long. Get out from behind the podium. 
walk around. Um, your body is just as expressive as your eyes. Maybe um, you will really drive home a point because of your hand gestures, or you're pointing to something on the screen behind you, uh, or reemphasizing that all of this information can be found in a specific spot online. So move around. It also helps increase your volume naturally. It increases your energy and it will regain the attention of those sleeping in the back of the room. Which we hope does not happen. Exactly. <laughs> So as uh, Samantha and I are both trained vocalists and performers, and as simulation specialists, our voices are a huge part of our job. Um, so there are many different exercises that one could use to both loosen and strengthen your voice prior to class. So um, these include maybe singing or just uh, repeating scales or, or vowel sounds, um, tongue trills, you know, that good old fashioned or lip rolls, or just once again, enunciating those vowels. And yes, it's going to feel ridiculous doing those, but who's not going to feel ridiculous? But they do help. They loosen up the parts of your face and your mouth. And you can do them in the privacy of your own home. You don't have to do these in front of your students or in front of anybody else. So to project, to be heard, speak from your diaphragm, from your stomach, not from your throat. You want to be heard, but you don't want to shout. And that's also putting a lot of strain on your voice if you are shouting or if you can feel it coming from your throat, you know you're, you're kind of doing it wrong. But it probably isn't a bad idea to encourage your students to try some of those exercises as well because they're going to be wearing masks. They might not be able to hear each other and you might not be able to hear and understand them. So maybe even trying these as a class isn't such a bad idea. And to, um, I know it's very frustrating when you're in the middle of a, a lecture and you've uh, got a, a roll going and you have somebody raise their hand and say, can you repeat that? I can't hear you. So um, as Daniel suggested, maybe using visual cues. So we suggest some hand signals, have them do the classic behind the ear so that you will know, oh, I need to raise my volume. Or if they do one of these, that means, can you go back and repeat that? That way, the only time they're raising their hand is when they have a specific question. So as we said, not everybody might feel comfortable doing these, these silly warm-ups or even feel like they, they have time to do them. But all of these are things you can do while you're showering or getting dressed or putting on your makeup or even driving. You can do them during your commute. Um, some stretches are, uh, are beneficial as well because they help loosen up your body, which also helps loosen up your diaphragm, your voice, uh, just doing big, deep, heavy sighs or yawns help to stretch all of that needed, uh, all the needed muscles and components that go into speaking. Um, so let's see, another interesting tip, and I know this is going to stink for people who love their coffee loaded with milk or creamer and sugar, but avoiding dairy when you know you have a long day of lecturing coming up because dairy, it, it clogs your throat and it, it inhibits your speaking. Um, you also want to avoid extreme temperatures with your food and beverages. So once again, sorry, coffee people, uh, don't make it too, too hot that it burns. Don't make it too cold either. And as Sam said, grandma knew best. If your throat is dry or scratchy or feeling irritated, uh, definitely have some hard candy or caramel or chocolate on you because sugar coats the throat and soothes it and makes it easier to speak. Uh, even a spoonful of honey works very well. Mary Poppins was on to something with that. Okay, so let's just say, any of these exercises, either you've forgotten or you just don't feel comfortable doing them, um, we understand that. So why not try putting your favorite song on while you're in the car driving on campus or singing in the shower? Now you might be thinking, I'm not a singer. That's fine, you're not performing for an audience. Singing actually has some wonderful benefits, not only to your voice, but also to your health in general. It helps relieve stress, whether you're singing alone or with other people, just the act of, of singing out loud helps to relieve stress. 
It can also stimulate and uh, the the immune response, which, as we all know, we all need better re immune responses right now. <laughs> so singing can also improve your lung function, which Hey, if you speak all day long, you need those lungs to be nice and strong, especially when you're projecting for all of your students to hear. It also just improves your mental health and your mood. Like we said, you don't have to be good at it as long as you're having fun, you're enjoying the moment. You love this song, so why not sing along? And when you're in a good mood, you're going to be more energetic in class, which is also a key component both Sam and Daniel, all of us have discussed repeatedly in this presentation. But most importantly, singing will help improve your speaking abilities. It helps loosen everything up, get your voice warmed up and relaxed so you're not struggling or having to clear your throat or repeat yourself the first thing you start lecturing. And finally, a few bonus tips if you are having to do a hybrid or a Zoom situation. So when lecturing, we now have the ability to add live captioning. You want to turn that option on when you are setting up a Zoom session. And um, it can help when you are doing a, a lecture, when it's very wordy, uh, to include that live captioning, maybe to make a point more clear or maybe to help engage your students. I do know there are some exceptions to that. Daniel, if you want to pop in here and um, tell us when using captioning would not be uh, for the best. Yeah, so there's a lot of research on cognitive load, especially when you're presenting visual audio and, you know, things to be read. So if there's an image for a student to pay attention to, and then you're talking over that image, and then you've got your captions going on, it's actually poor design for your lesson because they have, your students have multiple stimuli to pay attention to. So uh, it's important to be aware of that if you're going to use the captioning. Uh, consider captioning for just audio or just the audio and an image or an image with tags on it where you just ask them to look and ask questions. But it, th this is in the Zoom universe where, again, students are viewing this virtually. If it's in the classroom, it's a little bit different dynamic, but uh, there are some, some considerations that have to take place. So you're not overloading your students' attention spans or their ability to attend to all that information. Of course, reminding your students about Zoom etiquette, keeping their um, their microphones muted unless they speak, and of course, that fabulous trick if they just need to ask a question or pop in real quick, instead of unmuting and maybe forgetting to turn their microphone back off, have them press the space bar. When you are working within the VTT rooms, a Zoom room, write, uh, use a sticky note, use a chair or painter's tape on the floor to show your students where they need to stand, um, where the camera's pointed, and where the microphone is picking them up best so that the folks at home are getting as good of an experience as the ones who are actually in the classroom. And I think that's about it for us. So are there any questions that anybody has that we can help answer? We've got about four or five minutes. I mean, you've got us as long as you need us, but we're scheduled for another four or five minutes. Uh, so if anybody has any ideas they'd like to share or things that they've tried in the last few weeks while wearing a mask in the classroom that they've had success with, we are all ears. <laughs> really, Patrick, bagpipe lessons. I'm fascinated. Charmaine, if you're trying to speak, we can't hear you. OK, there we go. Yeah, I had to take my headphones off. It doesn't work. Um, one question I wanted to ask, and this is about inclusivity. We have, um, you know, especially when you're live, I'm not talking on Zoom, you know, where there's a difference. So when we're in a mask and speaking, there's a lot of students, we're assuming that they can hear. We do have international students that literally watches their lips in order for, for them to understand. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be another issue when you're teaching live on zoom and all that it's, it's it's totally different but when you're talking live and wearing a mask and trying to lecture i literally had a student tell me one time he had a professor that was 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 lecturing but the majority of the time he had his back turned to write whatever he was writing so it was very hard for him to understand what was going on because and even us as hearing people we tend to look at the lips right to understand um so Again, 
what can we do when you're you're teaching live um, in that perspective and we're wearing a mask and we're assuming everybody's hearing or understanding even though we're, we're sort of muffled but you do have people that can actually hear when you enunciate and and all of that but you still have those that have to read your lips sure uh, i would point back to the idea of uh, video recording for your lectures and posting those in D2L, because even if you play that during class, if that's in D2L, those students who need and want access to that information that they had in class, and that's probably better than them taking notes, even if it was word for word, obviously writing down word for word is a terrible way to take notes, but having that in a space and in a, a venue for them to access after the fact, where they can watch you speak without a mask in a safe environment for you, for them, and Play it at their own speed they can replay it when they need it. there's a ton of like like i said before there's a ton of research on just the benefits of giving students that kind of control over your lecture so that's that's never a bad idea especially if you have students who need to be able to see your lips or turn on some captioning or translate or whatever it is they might need that they can get out of a video that they're not going to get out of a live lecture thank you great tips though Melissa, good point. So there are some masks that have a clear window exactly for that purpose as well. And so uh, you could always find one of those and use that in class too. I, the one thing with that that I've noticed though is the fog issue. So if you're speaking because it's sealed around your face, they can tend to fog up. So I would, if you're going to go that route, I would do your homework on the best ones for teaching because if you're wearing that and it fogs up it's just like wearing masks that they can't see through anyway so uh, it helps only when it actually helps thank you <laughs> absolutely this is deborah i wanted to add that the humor is very helpful um in in teaching as and getting the students response it appears to relax them a, a little bit so that, that they could hear the next uh, bit of content or information being presented and they'll kind of laugh with each other and when they get in groups they'll that will carry on so thank you for that tip absolutely yeah we were when we were playing this uh, the three of us were talking about how you can show up to a classroom or a speaking event and have spilled your coffee or your drink all over you and it's comical it's not comfortable it's not the best physical appearance but if you burnt your throat and they can't hear you you're you're toast you can't you're if you're there to speak, they're, they're there to hear. So audio is everything in person, on video. The, the visual stuff, like Sam said, people will forgive visual mishaps, video mishaps. If you, you know, like I said, you can show up with stains all over your shirt because you tripped and spilled coffee or mustard on your tie, whatever. People will forgive that. They'll probably laugh a little bit, but they'll forgive it. If you can't speak, you're useless. So doing these things to, to prep your voice for, a production because that's what this really kind of has to be especially when you're behind the mask uh, those things are important and they're valuable for you and for your students self-care is important when you are a performer and for as many times as you are standing in front of your students you guys qualify as performers <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. so we are one minute past our time does anybody else have any questions comments anything we can answer before we embark on the rest of our afternoon. No? Well, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your time. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you want to brainstorm ideas, we're available anytime. Shoot us an email, fill out the support form on our website, come into the office. Uh, we're more than happy to help brainstorm ideas or, or work through this with you. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.